My guest this episode is the CEO of the Anna Liffey Drug Project, a national addiction service with a low threshold harm reduction ethos. They also play an active role in drug policy, advocating for the decriminalization of possession of drugs within a certain threshold and also the implementation of medically supervised injection centers. As well as all this, he also holds the glorious title of being my second cousin. This is Tony Dolphin. The term London Irish to me, right, I have an idea in my head of what that actually is. Okay. But I want you to tell me, what does London Irish mean to you? What does that encapsulate as a phrase? All right. So my parents uh, went over to London uh, from Wexford. Mum went over when she was 16 and dad went over when he was 12. And they went over there because, well, certainly my dad went over with, 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 his, with his dad uh, because... Um, my grandfather was was going over there to to work after the war as a labourer, and Mum went over there because there was no work in inner school and uh, and had to get over there. And um, so they were in a way they were economic migrants, you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, and they went over there. Mum certainly didn't want to leave, you know. Uh, Dad was twelve, so he went with his parents. He didn't have a choice. Didn't have a choice. But Mum didn't want to go at all. So so that's 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 where it comes from, right? Then then they get together, uh, uh, you know, when they're older, and and I think Dad met Mum. Um, through his sisters and stuff, you know the Irish okay. network, um, and um, and then they had myself and my brother and my sister. We were brought up in South London. Uh, we were born. I was born in South West London, but for the majority of my life, I was brought up in South East London and uh, around sort of Greenwich and Blackheath and and, and New Cross, Deptford areas. You know, and um, and growing up, I don't know how to explain it here. We, you know, the question was, you know, what was it like? Well, it wasn't great. You know, it wasn't great. Um, you, you, a lot of people, I assume, who were London Irish didn't, you know, they, they, might, they might have thought about it the same way as I did, I suppose, right? Mm. But I certainly felt a sense of displacement, you know, a, a lack of belonging, right? Um, Even it, though you were a naturalised... Yeah, because I sound like I've got a London accent mm. and all that sort of thing, and people go... I'll I give you a good example, right? So I was in school uh, in, a, in, in Blackheath, and um, I was sat next to a guy called Azawiki Madadubaya, and he's, he was Nigerian. Right, he's a lovely fella, and uh, and his dad uh, was Nigerian, and my dad was from Wexford, right, Wexford town. So we were chatting in the school, in the class, and the t- with the teacher and stuff, and the teacher was saying, "Well, well, clearly you're you're English to me, but he's he's not." And I was like, "Well, we're exactly the same, mm. right? My parents come from a different culture, as does his, right?" Um, and and it's it was and because you were white and you had an English accent, then people assumed you were English. But uh, but I, I I can remember going over to um, to friends' houses, like my friend Kevin, his mother was from Inniscorty as well, and their house looked the same, smelt the same as my house. Mm-hmm. And I know that, that might not make sense, but but no, you know does. when you come from a particular culture, you go in and the Sacred Heart is at the top of the stairs, <laughs> and the smell of boiled bacon in the in the kitchen and cabbage and all that. And and, and genuinely, that's what it was like, right? Um, now that that's they're, they're kind of. I mean, what was the obvious cultural difference to me? I guess over that over that time was uh, the obvious one I always go to is how um, how the Irish uh, you know uh, respond to, to death. You know, mm. um, a big, big funeral celebrations of life. We we did all that. I remember when my grandfather passed away. I, I would have seen him laid out, and 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 you know, very sad. But equally, everyone turned out, and and we and we celebrated his life. You know, um, and you know, I went to school the next day, and and because I'm a young, and 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 the other parents were a bit kind of shocked that a child had seen their grandfather laid out. In really? The, yeah. Okay. Right. So, so that that was that, that, it's it's hard to explain the cultural difference. There's one example. So, and also, um, you know, uh, generally as a generalization, um, sort of English funerals tend to be smaller and, and more intimate in terms of immediate family. You know. Did you so, find that your parents kind of stuck? Not to, I don't mean to say stuck to their own as such, but did your parents kind of move in a lot of Irish circles over there, yeah, or was yeah. it very mixed? Yeah. Um, no, we we mixed up. My my friend, no, I, went, I, I had friends who were English and who were who were who were from other other backgrounds and stuff. Um, but my parents mixed um, generally and with other Irish people. Of course, they knew English people as well, but but other Irish people. Um, so we went down to the local Catholic club, um, uh, and I, I didn't think anything of it. We all hoarded the Irish Catholic club. <laughs> Do you know, mm. because everyone down there at that time was Irish, was Irish right? Yeah. So I went down to the Logue St. Joseph's in, in Greenwich. Um, I'd go down and my parents would go and have a pint and uh, or whatever, and uh, and we'd be drinking Coke and, and playing games and all that and knocking around with other second-generation Irish kids. Um, and, you know, I suppose 
in the 60s, um, you know, you had no dogs, no blacks, no Irish, mm. right? Um, and we were just coming out. I was born in 1970. So we were coming out. It was still a bit of that around, you know, um, and uh, like uh, the Sex Pistols, uh, the old uh, punk rockers. They, I remember John Lydon talking about that sort of stuff um, uh, himself. And, uh, and, and sort of it, it, it res- that, that stuff resonated with me. I can remember, you know, the troubles were still on, you know, mm. there was, there was bombs going off across the UK. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was difficult. I mean, even some of the songs that, that were sung in the house weren't to be sung outside the house because they were <laughs> illegal, mm. you know, so, so it was different. Right? I mean, it, it, there's all these things that come together. So it wasn't, it wasn't cool to be Irish then, mm. you know, um, and, uh, and I guess, you know, there was things that happened that did make it cool, you know, and, you know, the Pogues came along and, yeah. and, and, and that stuff happened. Um, and suddenly, you know, it was, it was cool to be, to be Irish, certainly for my generation and, and, and my friends and stuff. Um, but, yeah, nonetheless, you had this feeling, right, of, I suppose, of, of, of not belonging, right? Mm. It's hard to describe. Uh, and certainly there's a thing called internalised oppression where, where, you know, um, where um, – minorities take on some of the uh, some of the things that are attributed to them. So, you know, they would talk about Irish people being thick and stuff like this, you know, and lazy and stuff. Mm. Um and uh and 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 you know, you could see that you could see that that kind of racism was would have an effect on people, you know. The the fact that they were not only away from their home but also sort of um experiencing like extreme racism, you know, the Irish generation. We were mm-hmm. close to the to the next generation. We were close to our parents. And my, my dad's friends would talk to me uh, when I was sort of 17, 18, 19, 20, like, you know, they, they, they knew my dad and we were, we were close. We'd go down to the local pub, we'd chat away to them, we'd see them in the street, sometimes we'd work alongside them. And we would, we would know them really well. Um, so, uh, so we were really close and we knew that they had had tough times. Um, but not, not, don't get me wrong, um, equally... Uh, London, particularly because London is not like the rest of the UK, but but London uh, was very good to people as well. You know, it was a melting pot of so it wasn't all doom and gloom. I don't want to get the wrong impression, mm. but but it was. But it was, there were there were problems, um, and uh, but there were good things as well about about growing up in London as well. So I wouldn't want to be too negative about it. <laughs> yeah, but you even see that in London today. Like I've been in areas of London where it's predominantly like you know Indian or Asian. You still see that that it's the culture of the area as such. Mm. You know, like um, well, this- people naturally come together. You know, they they, they do, and I don't I don't see the harm in that uh, mm. particularly. I know that I know that some uh, nationalists will, will 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 talk about people taking on cultures and all this sort of the British culture and all that. But the British culture is is a is a mix of loads of different cultures, and mm. the national dish is is curry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so I like. I mean, I think it's very uh, small-minded and naive to be thinking about the, the, this kind of pure British culture. It's not like it's a mixture of cultures, and certainly that's true in London. Did you ever yourself experience any kind of racism, be it socially or professionally, due to your Irish heritage? Uh, I I didn't personally. No, um, no, but I could see it. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I knew, you know, it was obvious. You know that 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 um. That there was a, a backlash against the Irish, particularly because of things like the Troubles, you know. Mm. Um, but I, and I suppose because of that story I told you a moment ago, where where people, because I had an English accent, because I was white, they just assume they assumed that you were English, right? Um, and yet you feel differently mm-hmm. and can't necessarily articulate it really well. And I still can't articulate it really well. Do you, do you know what I mean? The sense of belonging or not belonging. Mm-hmm. So, um, do so, yeah. people even now, just in your current role, find mm. it interesting that <laughs> you're actually of Irish parentage and you kind of grew up internally feeling Irish, uh, but the English accent kind of speaks differently about you? It, well, um, I, I don't know. I mean, they wouldn't say it to my face per se, right? Uh-huh. But I'll tell you a story about how a, a friend of mine in Wales, um, uh, Aoife Glynn, who, who was at the time was a director of of um, of Sans Cymru, another another drugs charity over there, and he was putting a conference together. He wanted someone to come over from Ireland, you know, a nice mm. Irish brogue, lovely Irish lilt <laughs> to their voice. On. Yeah, like he looked up, he was trying to find out who he could who he could approach. Yeah, uh, didn't know anybody, so he he picked up the phone to the Anna Liffey Drug Project in mm. Dublin, a bloke called Tony Duffin. Duffin's good. Good Irish name, mm. and uh, and he rang up, and I answered the phone, <laughs> and um, and he was very polite to me and all that, and mm. uh, all that. But he 
he did say afterwards, like, oh, I was so disappointed you were from England. <laughs> <Right? No way. laughs> I was like, but like, we, look, I went over there and I did the job and, and, and he understood um, when you explain yourself, you know, where you're from. So I don't, and sometimes I, I, I do want to explain that to people. Mm. I want people to understand, but it's almost, it's almost like an apology. Do you know what I mean? I don't mean to be apologising for yeah. it, but it is like that. Um, but I've never like when uh, like I I came to uh, and we'll probably talk about this a bit more. But I, I did when I when I came to 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 Dublin, I, I felt at home. You know, mm-hmm. when I came to Ireland, I should say, I, I felt at home and I felt like I belonged and I felt that I fitted into the culture. Do you know? Um, and I do think that there's a num like there are people in my situation from my background living in Ireland and probably not you know people don't talk about it as much I, I was down in Wexford recently at my parents place and everybody I was talking to all the adults there had London accent right <laughs> mm. <laughs> and um and because their the, their parentage was Wexford and mm. they'd been brought up there and they'd come back over to here and um and yeah, so there's, there's, and then, and then, you know, that's that's true of uh, an extension of my family down in Skibbereen in Cork, and then through work or through my own life, I bump into people with English accents, whether it's from London or elsewhere, um, who have lived there for a while, and they um, they have the same experience. So there's quite a lot of like a lot of people left Ireland and settled down elsewhere, um, and my experience was in London, but there's quite a lot of people like me over there, you know, and whether and not everybody identifies as strongly uh, with that as, as I did or my, my siblings did, you know? You said that when you came back over, you really identified with it. Did that come at a certain age, like when you proper moved back, or did you feel it even as a teenager on visits over during the summers? Mm, that is a really good question. Um, I, I, think, I think when I look back on it, I think that I, that I didn't feel like I belonged in Wexford, particularly mm-hmm. when I went over, because that's where we went to, and uh, which was great, by the way. It didn't mm-hmm. mean that I didn't enjoy it. I had a great time. We'd, we'd knock around with family there, but it doesn't, it, I just suppose I didn't, you know, feel uh, 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 as a, at home as I have done since, since coming over later and, and living in, in Dublin, particularly. Maybe because Dublin is, is a city and, and yeah. I grew up in a city. But, um, but I, but I suppose I went one year. I went over when I was eighteen. I went over. Um, I went around six, just to throw that in there. How much older? Yeah, <laughs> Jesus, stop. And uh, and uh, I went across the green, and I went past. This, I went over to the the shop over there by. It was called the Dolphin back then. Yeah, it's uh, now, the Dolphin Bar was the bar. The Dolphin Bar. Um, it was called the Sailing Cot. It's the Sailing Cot now, yeah. and there's a Londis there. Londis, but it. it wasn't a it wasn't a Londis then. But I, anyway, I remember that shop. I remember that yeah. shop as a kid being brought down to buy onion rings and super splits. That's right. Because yeah. of course, my granddad lived around the corner. Uh-huh. You know, you know, now, Brady's Pub on the corner as well. Well, I was in, there's another story about that. Anyway, but um, but. Uh, I went into that shop and I remember this guy, this old man came up to me and he asked me if I was Tommy Duffin's grandson. Uh, and I said I was. And he said, yeah, you look like him. No and that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> and if you come from London, right, where there's not many extended family around yeah. you, it kind of freaks you out a bit. Uh-huh. But, but it was lovely. I mean, at the same token, that was lovely, you know. Um, and I do look like him. Um, but uh, so that was lovely. So that, that, was, that was cool as well. But coming back, I suppose, when I moved over in 2000, um, uh, yes, I, I immediately enjoyed Dublin, um, particularly because we've, we've been living there since, for 18 years now, mm. um, and, and really felt at home and fitted in. And it was probably the mixture of Irish culture and the fact that it's a, it, it's a city as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, London Irish, when you were in, became your late teens and socially started going out to things and gigs, obviously we yeah. get to your obsession with the Pogues and yeah. all things of like that as well. But did you find that? There was kind of a social crew of people like you were big into the post. We've already established that. But were your friends that you hung around with and went to these gigs? Were they all Irish as well? Was it like a pack of Irish people who just <laughs> ran wild socially? Uh, this is how I imagine growing up London Irish okay. would have been. All right. So so I went to a school in, in southeast London where there was that was uh, De La Salle brothers, you know, and they were all Irish brothers. Right. Mm-hmm. And and. I don't know what their selection policy was, but many of us were London Irish. Mm-hmm. We were second generation. So a lot of my pals were already sort of of that background. Okay. And, um, and we, uh, it's interesting because um, London is, uh, or certainly growing up back then in London, it was, uh, it, it, you know, it was a, lo- it was a, it was a, a 
a lonely place, you know, like people, you know, people wouldn't uh, engage with strangers and stuff, you know. Mm. Um, so you, you you left school, you went with your, you, you had a group of friends and you you, you, you go socialising locally and then you go up to town to work and you come back. So you think that you'd have this huge metropolis, you, you know, you, you're always around. But nonetheless, people are people. So we would, we would knock around together and we would go up to town, we'd go and see the gigs. Now, of course, we had extended friends through, through networks and stuff. But yeah, and, I, and you'd recognise people at gigs. So I'd go to gigs like, um, I'd go and see bands like the Pogues, the Men They Couldn't Hang, New Model Army, Carter USM, all these kind of gigs. And when you go regularly, as, as you, you'll, you'll be aware, you start to, you start to see people. You, you recognise the other fans. So you'd be there, you'd be meeting up beforehand and afterwards and all that sort of thing. And, um, and, and some of those bands had massive, like, like proper kind of cult followings, mm-hmm. you know. And, um, and, and so you'd, you'd, you'd build really strong bonds, you know. Um, like, it, uh, not Friday, not yesterday, but Friday before, I went to New Model Army uh, in Button Factory in Dublin and, like, lead singer 62 now, but the energy in the room, like, is, mm. was, was like it was back in the day. It was brilliant, you know, um, and had a, had a great gig. But, but, uh, and would you have found that the crowd were around your age or was there a new generation of people who had just... It was both. Them? I mean, okay. there was definitely people in my age. You know, I'm, I'm 48, as I said, and, uh, and there was definitely people like uh, older, you know, there was, there was, uh, there were 60 year olds there and there was, and there was, there was, I suppose mid twenties. I suppose like that's what they looked like to me. People mm. who were sort of mid twenties upwards, um, and that's interesting about gigs and, mm. and bands and stuff. That because um, because obviously uh, bands don't just happen. They 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 take their inspiration from from the new bands. They take their inspiration from elsewhere. So um, so having these bands from the eighties still gigging and coming around is is well, I love it. <laughs> At what stage did the obsession with the Pogues? begin and how important were they not just musically to you but also kind of like we, we spoke about socially um i would imagine being london irish and with a lot of the band being kind of particularly the same mm. there was a kinship there which is what cultivated the whole yeah so they, they i think they, it was about 1982 when they started to emerge and 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 uh, emerge about pogue mahone now i was i was only 12 at the time and 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 uh and you probably I weren't was born, born september 1982 about, right and um and and so i was 12 i was living in south east london and the only way you read it, there was no internet right this sounds, it sounds like the dark ages there was no internet there was no spotify there was no nothing like that how you found out about songs were uh, and and bands and and such were uh, John Peel you know, on the radio. You'd listen to John Peel and all this weird and wonderful music would come up, and then he'd pick bits out that you liked, and then you ran down to the record shop with your few pence, and you went and found. You went through the. I, could, I probably spent weeks of my life going through, uh, flicking through albums. Right back mm-hmm. then, going through it all. So anyway. That's how you found out, and that's how you shared your music and all that sort of thing. Can so, you still remember the first time you heard him on Peel? It, I look, it's, memory is is, <laughs> is is difficult, right? But but particularly uh, but, given the gigs that follow. But but, but, but I know the feeling, right? I know, and yeah. I, I know that that you know, punk had come and gone, or yeah, you know, seventy seven had come and gone. It was five years later, uh, and and it was sort of mid eighties, and. That you, you kind of felt like you'd missed. I felt like I'd missed the boat. I liked punk rock. I was too young in that when it was when it was when it first came out, and then this band turns up that is mashing up um, uh, Irish music and punk, right? Because obviously, like Shane had gone around being Shane O'Hooligan and mm-hmm. in the Nipple Erectors and all this sort of thing, right? And um, and uh, he, he 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 was just really exciting. So I remember I remember listening to songs like. Um, Greenland whale fisheries from from the first album and all that sort of thing f- through the radio yeah but I don't remember exactly the day but um but it but I remember like being excited by it and all that sort of thing um and then you know uh 84 you started to, you started to I think Red Roses for me came out in in uh, first and then there was um oh uh Rum Sodomy and the Lash in 85 and that was that was that was really important I was 15 and uh, I was st- I was you know, getting into it was really into my music by then. And my first, my first gig was when, um, my brother, Brian, uh, went across town to the Hammersmith Palais to watch the Pogues on St. Patrick's night in 1986. That was a good gig to go to. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the energy, right. The energy in that room. I remember it now. I remember that. Right. And, um, uh, it was a mixture of old and young of 
of first generation Irish and second generation Irish and anything else in like everything else because at least you know they weren't the the one thing about bands like that the Pogues were they they were they were inclusive you know uh-huh. there was no racism no nothing you know um, so men women young old I saw grannies you know up on the balconies and uh, were up and children you know children up there and then we were down there jumping around at the front and acting like lunatics and um, I was still talking about the gig or your sister's wedding that I remember <laughs> we'll get to that later oh Jesus, oh, Jesus. <laughs> anyway so um, so yeah so we were down there and that was that was my first gig and uh, what a great gig to have gone to um yeah, so all around that time, so the mid eighties, um, I remember one one um, one time, I was probably a few, probably about eighty eight or something, eighty nine. I went up to Newcastle for a weekend. I saw a secret gig with the Pogues on the Friday night, a, a gig with them, and they couldn't hang on the Saturday night. And the proper full Pogues gig on the Sunday night. Mm. Went home on the Monday. I was in bits. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine so. It was, it was shambles. I was young and I enjoyed it. It was great. So yeah, so it was good stuff. Have you ever met McGowan? Because to me, this strikes as, like, obviously I wasn't around back then, so I don't know just how big the Pogues were in that scene in terms of being in London. But, like, I just kind of imagine that they did a gig and then you might go to a pub the next day and McGowan is sitting there in bits. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, they were my heroes and it was difficult to just walk up and start chatting to people. Like, he'd be 10 years older, actually 12 years older than me. So, you know, so, so, but my sister met, 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 met Shane and stuff and Mm. would have known some of the band and things like that. She was a little bit older than me. So, so she was, able to, to engage with that but but it, no is probably the short answer what i did do was um my dad came home one evening and he said uh he'd driving home and listening to radio they, they said oh there's going to be um there's going to be a, a pogues video mu- music video being recorded with adrian edmondson but right? mm-hmm, of course uh, he's going to be the director uh, of this thing and you've got to get down to the, to the rather high tunnel there's some warehouse down there and they want dancers for this thing and we were like yeah i'm up for that <laughs> i can so, dance <laughs> yeah yeah i can now right and we went down there what you had to do was wear a pogues t-shirt or some 60s gear uh so i had a i had a paisley was was still back in in the 80s mm-hmm. so i had a paisley shirt through that oh my brother put on his pogues t-shirt we went down to rather high next morning at half eight and um and we're in the yeah 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 gear. well i actually i'm in the yeah 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 video right Unfortunately for him, the other way these, these things get cut afterwards. Yeah. He didn't make it. No so, way. Right, yeah, yeah. Stinger for Brian. Yeah, yeah. But the point being on that was I remember Shane coming in at sort of half nine in the morning, like maybe a quarter of a bottle of wine in hand, uh, and Victoria Mary Clark, Mary Clark was with him. And um, yeah, it was all rock and roll stuff that came in, did the performance. I was like, uh, mm. you know. So like it, it, it was, uh, I was a punter. I was I was I was a guy. Who went along, bought the bought the tickets, went up the front, jumped around. You know, the idea of sort of meeting your heroes back then was was uh, not something that was open to me. I guess, yeah, so I was, much. I know it's it, it's kind of it's different for me looking back on it because I just see the Pogues as being very much central to that scene, but mm. I didn't realize if they were like kind of rock stars or were they more accessible. You know, as opposed to like being kind of on a level I where... Think they, I know, I think, first and I think they were open, they were accessible, but... but um, There's a fantastic story about Shane playing a gig in Wexford about 10, 15 years ago in Blackwater, I think it was, and uh, basically just got hijacked after the gig and ended up in one of the local estates and was there for about two or three days doing all sorts. <laughs> and uh, they, they were think, looking from left, right and centre and couldn't find them. You know? I heard one about a similar one down in Ballon Skelligs in Kerry. Uh, I think there's probably stories like that around the place. Um <laughs> Yeah, no, and and uh, and a friend of mine, Paul Condon, who's from Wexford, uh, played played tin whistle with um, Shane McGowan and the Popes. Amazing. Um, so he so and he toured with them for a year. So he has great stories too. The 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 Pogues were important. I think that the one thing that people must because I, I we see things differently when we look back, right? And and Fairy Tale in New York is a brilliant Christmas song, but that's not what the Pogues were about. Of course, right? they they were much more important than that. Certainly to to us, you know, in terms of growing up and 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 then coming burst out to the scene, like you know the whole Crombie coats and mm-hmm. uh, and and the broke. It was shoes. a movement. Oh, it was it was it was like it was the next punk rock thing. It was the next thing, you know, like it was. It you influenced know, you'd your had, you'd style. You had Dexys Midnight Runners do Come on Arlene, which was very very good, right? But but then the Pogues turned up and sort of sort of added the the punk rock uh, element to it, and and that that really attracted uh, us to it, you know. Um, so yeah, so we dressed like that. We went to school. We messed up our hair, and we we uh, we we put on our Crombie coats and our black jeans and skinny jeans and uh, uh, shoes and boots, and off we went, off to our gigs and things, and and had this sense of identity. 
It's interesting because I always attributed the Pogues to just being that band, even though of the Irish links, but they were that band that all my mad cousins from England were into, <laughs> right? Because growing up as a kid, that was yeah. the kind of thing that was you were labelled with almost. I don't know, and like as I said, I mentioned quickly like your sister's wedding. I remember being a kid at that, and just wildness and like Pogues <laughs> banging out of it. But as an adult, um, like I kind of my introduction to the Pogues, I'm not sure if if which came first, but I remember watching The Wire. That TV series set in Baltimore, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and a lot of them are of yes, Irish heritage. Yeah. And you see them in the Irish bar, and um, like the soundtrack the, has got the Pogues. Yeah, there's it's, multiple yeah, body Pogues of America tracks. and all that. Yeah, exactly. And like Rainy Night in Soho and stuff, yeah. I already knew just from being into music. And about, I'd say it's maybe the bones of 10, 12 years ago. I remember looking up the greatest hits album, and sorry, Shane, but I illegally downloaded it. <laughs> and um, I remember just really getting into it and just being like, oh, geez, okay, so that's what that fuss is all about. And it's like, it's a real testament that it's still almost the soundtrack to so many people's lives even now you yeah. know it- well look i went to i was really lucky i went along to um the shane mcgowan 60th oh, and the kind of a, a celebration hall. in the concert hall it happened to be on my 48th birthday nice. so 15th of jan uh, and i went along and look shane didn't well, shane did perform at the end a couple of songs but two and a half hours of uh fantastic lyrics and music right performed by people from all over the world right mm-hmm. um you know top names phenomenal stuff much more than just fairy uh, fairytale in new york much more than of that. course like uh, the legacy the legacy that he has already yeah. is incredible you know and like you've got johnny depp hanging out of him at any opportunity yeah. and one of the biggest hollywood stars in the Jeez. world it's just it's so crazy you know when you yeah. kind of think about it um because shane mcgowan is nearly so famous for well back in the day the teeth and more modern day kind of just for how much of a sessioner and yeah. lunatic that he is known to be, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and I guess, I suppose like it would be, it'd be important to say that when, cause I don't want to sound, I want to come out right. Right. When, when, when you want, when you're living in Ireland, sorry, London, and you're of an Irish background, um, you know, you want, and you want, you want to be a man. Right, mm. so you want you want to get out there, right? You want to be drinking pints of Guinness. I know it sounds really cliche, but that's that's how naive you were. That's what it right? was, yeah. And it was like, okay, so I want to stand in the pub and drink pints and all that. And then the Pogues were there and they were doing it. So yeah, there was a lot of drinking, you know. There was, um, and it, uh, being Irish is much more than that, of course mm. it is. Of course, but uh, when you're young, when you're young, you feel that you feel that that's that's the thing, you know. Um, so there was, so we had some good nights, but um, but. Uh, Again, it is it is it's much more than that to be Irish. You mentioned there are like various gigs that you would have attended. Obviously, there was the Fla in London, which would have been mm. a huge thing. I didn't realize that ran until two thousand and three. Before it was, I always just thought it was kind of up to the mid nineties. Yeah. yeah, I didn't go. I went in. I went in at the, uh, at the early nineties to the Fla, and, I, and, I, and, on, and on that night that I was at the Shane McGann celebration, I met Vince Power briefly. You know, and I chat with him, and I got to say to him, you know, thanks very much. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it's really important because the Fla was uh, in, in London. It, it was up in Finsbury Park. And uh, it was a big deal. It was a massive celebration of Irish m- music and culture. And uh, and again, like if you were London Irish and everybody else, mm. like, it would, like everybody else, you know, loads of people piled in and we had a great time. But if you were London Irish, it, but it's so cool to be, um, you know, uh, Irish, uh, of Irish heritage. It was kind uh, of like being from Manchester in the 90s. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Being like the Gallagher's somewhat. Yeah, well, that was, that, well, I mean, that, you know, that, that, that mixture of things was, was going on as well. So, um, so my wife, uh, Sarah, she, she was up in Manchester at the same time. So she was, she was up at the, um, Hacienda and she, she okay. was, she was at Spike Island for the big, the oh, big the Stone Roses right? thing. So you no can interview her another time, right? Wow. And, uh, and so, so, but we were, I was down the other side uh, at that time. I didn't know her then, um, uh, in London, the other side of that culture. Two little microcosms of music kind of existing. In yeah, world, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and very way, cool to be attached quite, to either. And quite different. Mm. But now when you look back on it, people, you know, start to meld it together and talk about it in a similar vein, you know. Um, uh, a, a time, you know, because I, I mean, I remember going home um, from school. I must have been 15, I think. I think I'm getting this right now, the date wise, right? Uh, maybe 1985. I walked in from, from school and there's a guy in, in the living room. Uh, in in leather jeans and a leather jacket and this mad hair, right? I knew exactly who he was, right? And uh, and I, I was like, oh, so I had a green blazer on, ran upstairs, I got my denim jacket on, my, my jeans. I came down, and leant nonchalantly against the door, and said, "Do you want a cup of tea?" That was Douglas from uh, the G's, the Mary Chain, the bass player, right? Mm-hmm. He was a, the, my sister knew 
the Jesus Moonshine. But I went to school, like, and he was like, uh, I had it enough, like, <laughs> big Scottish accent, you know, mm. have a cup of tea. I made him a cup of tea and all this. Like, I was like, oh my God, wait till the lads hear about this. Mm. Went into school the next day and I was like, you won't believe this. They're like, no way. That's so <laughs> yeah. So anyway, look, I mean, there was a lot. So my point about that was that there was a lot of different scenes. You had like, you had the Manchester scene, you had this kind of like the Jesus and Mirror Chain, the kind of, um, I suppose, goth scene and all that sort mm. of thing going on, the punk scene, the Irish music scene. Um, and there was a big meld of things. So, I mean, I liked being, I, I was really into the jam, right? Paul Weller, all of that course. sort of stuff, the mod stuff. Um, Did uh, you have a mod suit? I didn't have a mod suit so much, but it was more of a mashup yeah. <laughs> of, of, of styles. I wouldn't have said I was a goth, but I wouldn't have said I wasn't. I wouldn't have said I was a mod, but I wouldn't have said I wasn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It was a bit like that, um, which is probably better than just like uh, just, just doing one thing. But anyway, mm. um, so yeah, so there was all that going on. And, uh, and look, a good band is a good band, you know. And in terms of like large scale events, was the FLA kind of the pinnacle of that or was there other stuff geared towards that back then? <sighs> I or- suppose that was the, that, that, that was the biggest thing. Thing. I mean, the other, you know, the other, the other sort of the, the Reading festivals and stuff like that. You know, they they would uh, or go into long to say um, the Super Bowl down in Milton Keynes. I was down there to see Guns and Roses and the Cult open for them, and you know, all that sort of stuff. Good, good, big gigs, but they weren't. It wasn't about the the, the Irish thing there they, at those ones. It was just about good music and and yeah. So the Flower was the was the kind of thing. The, the mean fiddler in Harlston, obviously another Vince venue. Power of venture. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, yeah, absolutely. That's what I mentioned. I guess uh, not, not a great venue to go down to. Like you know, to to cross London. Uh, from southeast London to northwest London, uh, you, you <laughs> took your life in your hands. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's another thing I wanted to ask about because, you know, mm. in terms of like youths and groups and like mm. London is a minefield now, like with mm. knife crime and everything well, I, that's going on. Like yeah. back then, what was London like? What was the social vibe of London but growing it's, up? It's, as like in it's your different late now, like when you're 48, right? But 30 years ago when I was 18, you know, um, you'd be walking along and I wasn't looking for trouble, but, but you know. Others were. You'd be, you'd be running, you'd, you'd be a pretty fast runner. <laughs> um, I, I was on Carnaby Street one time, probably around 1988, and um, I used to knock around in a punk pub called the Dew Drop Inn in New Cross. And I mention that now because I was, in, I was in Carnaby Street and I was looking for clothes and stuff. And I came out and there was a big pile of skinheads walking down the street. And as they were walking down the street, they were causing a bit of havoc and uh, and shutters were being pulled down, you know, like the, the, the shops. It's like some of a film. It was, it was literally like they were walking along and, um, and there was a guy I recognized from who was much, it was a bit older than me, um, from the, from the Jew drop in. His name was Colin. And, uh, he was a big punk, big dreads, right? Big tall fella. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not small, but like he was, he was a big lad. And, um, and, I we stood there and I thought, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get killed here. Right. <laughs> And and I looked at Colin and I didn't really like he knew me but didn't know me. Do you know what I mean? One yeah. of those kind of like like he was a he was a face, I wasn't, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And um and he looked at me and he said, Just don't move, right? Just don't move, stand there. And we stood there and he's and he, he just died, the biggest one, he just died him and this group all walked through and they left us alone and they carried on walking away, you know. But it was uh, but that 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 the tension, mm. right? I was terrified, right? I, I mean I would have had to How many of you were there with you? We two of us. Two. It was about ten of them, <laughs> but but I was with Colin, right? And and he and 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 he probably won't remember that, but I remember it. <laughs> wow. But um, yeah. But that 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 was what it was like. That's like nineteen eighty eight, right? Boom. There was uh that that particular pub um in New Cross. There was a massive scene there of punk rock and 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 crusties and and dreads and all that sort of stuff. Your cool. sister was a punk at one time, wasn't she? I remember the green hair. Yeah, oh yeah. And and like I mentioned, the Jesus and Mary chain and all that yeah. sort of stuff. She used yeah. to give me stick when I kind of had a mohawk and I used to meet her on the main street in Wexford when I'd be home at the weekend mm. and she'd say, I taught you everything you know. And I was like, <laughs> don't even have a real proper mohawk, okay? Uh, I just remember, and like, I, I remember asking her one time, like, what did you use to put in yours to keep it on? She was like, super glue. I was like, what? Funny what, like super funny glue what I remember hair. though. So we were walking through um, Rectory Road in, in Enniscorty where my mum had grown up and uh, we were in our denim jackets and the hair was all over the place when I had it. And uh, and the black jeans and the dark the the, the Ray Bans were on and all that. Some little kids like walking past us and he's like, "How are your pop stars?" <laughs> <laughs> we were like, "You yeah, whoever, man." <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so it was me, and my brother, and my sister. I should say walking down the road. But anyway, yeah. So um, yeah, look, it was it was a great time. Uh, I definitely would say that 
at the time, you like I said, you felt like you'd missed the boat. Punk rock had come and gone. Mm. But really looking back on it, there was great music. And, and there was something scene. you were a part of then. It was a, it, a separate yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. But when you were in the, in the eye of the whirlwind, you were kind of like going, oh, I wish I'd been around yeah. five, ten years earlier. For yeah, this. and like, um, yeah, the, the, you know, people like the Buzzcocks, um, and it's worth noting that uh, Pete Shelley passed away only recently, didn't mm. he? Um, but uh, you... you, you I don't think they were touring at that point. They obviously came back to tour again, but you'd miss them. Uh, Stiff Little Fingers were still around, so you could, you could go and see them. Um, but the Sex Pistols were gone. The Clash had you know, the, the, dived off a cliff. Um, uh, but Joe Strummer was around. I'll tell you a quick one about, about going to a gig in... You, know, you, you often see there's a kind of classic scene where Shane McGowan is singing Fairy Tale in New York with Kirsty McCall. Uh, that gig, um, I think it's the same one. It's 1988. And uh, it was in the Brixton Academy. I, th- I think I'm right, right? Um, but I certainly went to a gig there, which which looks a lot like that one. Mm. And uh, at that gig, you had, you know, the, like Kirsten McCall would come on and do Fairy Return New York. Um, Shane would often go off uh, and the band would play a couple of numbers with doing whatever he was doing. Mm. And the band was, was would play a couple of numbers uh, with Joe Strummer, right? Wow, okay. um, and before the band, the Pogues had come on, the specials would play. Mm-hmm. Right, that would be the opening act for the Pogues, and when the Pogues were playing their uh, their their numbers that had a brass section, members of the specials were on stage. So you, so it was a pretty pretty amazing gig. Now mm. I was just jumping around like a lunatic at the front, but the point being is 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 that I guess when I look back on it, they were amazing gigs. Right? Yeah, of course. Uh, but I probably didn't realize at the time. I was I you never I wanted, really do. I wanted though. Shane to come back out. Yeah, right. I was like, yeah, 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 get off the stage. I want to get, get Shane out here. <laughs> and we'd all go mad again. But anyway. Yeah. Um, just really quickly, before we put the music angle thing to bed. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. What's your feeling on the whole uh, furore that's kicked up over fairy tale in New York in recent times, over the whole faggot word? Uh, look, I, actually, you know, I was, I was reflecting on that really briefly earlier today. And I really understand why people find it offensive. I, the, the word, mm-hmm. the word, right? But I thought that Shane's response... Um, where he sort of explained that the context and the, that the characters aren't always the uh, nice and pleasant people, um, but it was in the context of, of it was written what about eighty eight or something, right? Mm-hmm. So, so you know that that's his explanation. Uh, I do understand that people find the word offensive, um, but I uh, know there's no but. I, uh, no, that that's really unfortunate. Um, I don't think it's going to be. Leaked or anything it doesn't seem to be. I don't think there's anything. No, there hasn't around. been the. It was no. it was two RTE DJs who, uh, yeah, yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah, you know, brought it to the fore, and RTE released a one line statement to basically saying we shall not be censoring it. Yeah. But again, that kind of you get to the point. Then where do you stop with that? Are you going to now censor it from films that are really popular because it's the same kind of thing that you know Shane and Kirsty are kind of playing roles in the song, and I know you don't have to watch yeah. a film every day because that song is always on the radio, but it's a it's a period of time that from whence it came, you know, yes, it wasn't a nice thing to say. And nowadays it's not politically correct, but we live in the age of being offended, you know? And, mm. and I always say that, like, I, I find like the internet has given just soapboxes to people to just air their grievances with things. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, there's merit in it. And then other times there's not so much. And it's a little bit too far. And you're kind of like, going, look, this is ridiculous. The song is the song. It's been that way for what, for 30 years now yeah. and you know it's just like just just leave it be if you don't like it I understand you know but that's your opinion you know th- just because you think that way doesn't mean that everybody has to jump to you know yeah. uh, to, to placate you like, look I mean nobody I don't want to offend anybody do you know what I mean like but um, but the, as you say it's a cultural thing it was a, of its time um, and certainly like you don't want uh, uh, words are important right but it's how you use them and why you use them Right. And and then how it makes the person feel. In, uh, interesting times, uh, hopefully, like uh, maybe it's cold outside. They're talking about, you know, taking yeah. it off. It's crazy. Yeah. This is something you told me really recently, which really surprised me, because in later years, in the last 10 years or so, I've become really involved in photography. Yeah. It's just something that I'm kind of into. I've done a bit of traveling and um, kind of like to have cool looking memories of places I've been or whatever. But you uh, kind of got that book at a much younger age. You almost yeah. ended up doing it professionally. Yeah, so I, I, I was I was at I went on holiday to, to Wexford, right? Came back from Wexford. I had a little camera, right? And I went in to school, right? And this is this is important, right? Because teachers are really important, right? And when they're uh, and they have a strong influence on, on children. 
And Pat Nan, who was my teacher at the time, one of my teachers at the time, uh, was really enthusiastic about the, the, the photographs that I'd taken, snaps that I'd taken on mm-hmm. holiday. And she was talking about what a great eye I had and all this sort of stuff. And that encouragement stuck on that one conversation. It made me want to become a photographer, right? As n- maybe as unbelievable as that sounds, right? I'm telling you, that was the moment. Uh, and I wanted to do photography. I was fascinated by it. And Dad had to come along and didn't have to do anything but he built me a bloody uh dark room in the no loft way. and we we, we learned how to uh, p- um, process and, uh, and and uh develop uh, pictures black and white pictures all sorts of stuff right? proper art college. form in itself especially yeah. nowadays with the advent of digital yeah yeah it was it was like it was all chemicals a stink of it mm. like um but anyway we we did all that we went i went to college and i studied uh, photography and, uh, and and film studies particularly and uh but anyway well uh, you know it was I left probably about 89 uh, uh, college and stuff. And, you know, I wanted to get into photography and I didn't know how I was going to do it. So I stuck my CV around anyway. I got in with this uh, business called the, called, called organi- uh, sorry, organization called AC Cooper. And AC Cooper still, still exists. Uh, and they were a fine art photographers and they took me on as an assistant photographer or photographer's assistant. And, um, and then soon after I was, I was sent as an assistant photographer <laughs> to, uh, to Christie's auction house to take photographs of fine art. And in a way, like I was glad that I had managed to get there to do that. But in another way, like it was kind of repetitive work. Um, and, uh, and maybe, maybe sort of knock the stuff out of me a little bit, but I still love photography, but, but, uh, but, and, and, and certainly digital photography and stuff is, is, is fantastic for everyone. It's very accessible, but, but, um, again, it, to do it correctly and do it right, you gotta, you gotta have good, you gotta have skill, right? Mm. But anyway, so I did that and, and that was great, but, uh, yeah, just, just unfortunately at about 1991, uh, there was a recession uh, pretty serious one, and last in, first out, I was gone. I was only, I was only twenty-one, and and then there was a period of of unemployment of about eight months, um, and that's when I started getting into this this stuff here. Uh, that's what my next question was. What prompted the move to a more social aspect of employment? Yeah. So, as I say, un- unemployed. It was actually, do you know what? I was living at home with my mum and dad, and I was unemployed. And, uh, and most of my mates were as well. So it wasn't that bad. Right. <laughs> so, um, so I had food and a roof over my head and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and could go down. But one night I went down to the pub and uh, I was talking to my friend Pete and, um, we were chatting away and he said, uh, that he was going to go and volunteer some time, you know, cause naturally months were passing by and we were like, we, we need to do something. You mm-hmm. know? So we, uh, I went off. Uh, and no, he said that, and I said, "No, right, okay, what well, I'll do, I'll do that." It sounds like a good idea. I kind of interested, right? Now, there's more to it than this, right? But but that that was the kind of when I the pivotal moment when I said, "Right," I'm, and I went off, and I did, I did. Peter didn't, but he did eventually. But I did. Probably the beer was talking that night, but I did. I went off and uh, and and I and I went off and started volunteering in Dean Street in in Soho in a night shelter for young people, and uh, you know, so I was 21. And this place took in people who were kind of 17 to 25, my peers, right, mm-hmm. essentially. But these were young people who were on the streets, sex workers, drug users, um, having to beg and do anything, you know, steal and shoplift, anything to, to get through the day and get and, and, and you know, and just survive. So it was, it was that particular piece of work that introduced me to working in a harm reduction way and low threshold way and work with them. But just to just, I suppose, come back to your question, which was why, why did you go into that? I always, I always was interested in people living on the streets, street drinkers, particularly there was a lot of Irish living on the streets of London at the time, a lot of Scottish, a lot of English, a lot of other, lot, lot, plenty of other uh, nationalities. But, but, but of course I was fascinated by the Irish, the Irish people who were, who had slipped through the gaps and gone onto the streets and, Drinking was obvious. So the drug taking wasn't as obvious, but drinking you could see. You know, there was a lot of people sleeping rough, a lot of Irish people. And um, and I just, I don't know, I just had this really fascinating... And the other thing about the Pogues, I don't want to bring it back to that for no, a minute, but, but but they were from... They, their, their thing was about street culture as well. They were from the streets and, and there was a lot of drinking going on. So that all sort of dovetailed as well, you know? And uh, so I was fascinated by all that. 
Um, and one, my mum in Wexford there the other day, she, not the other day, probably about two years ago, she said to me, um, I know when you got into this. And I was like, oh yeah, when's that? <laughs> Thinking, no, you don't. And she named it. Um, we were at my cousin's wedding in the uh, at Westminster Cathedral, probably ooh, probably about eighty five. We were stood on the piazza outside the cathedral, right? And uh, I was all about the pogues, as I said. Uh, a lot of street drinkers on the piazza. It's one of those places where um, I think I think the that the cathedral uh, was more or less established there. The church was established here because it's one of those spaces where people have always congregated. Mm-hmm. Right, we're talking about hundreds of years, and um, and I guess uh, and I guess I, well, what happened was I went over and started chatting to these uh, Irish guys who were drinking on the streets. I was just really interested, so I went over and walked over and chatted, thinking nobody was paying a blind bit of attention to me. But of course, my mother was watching me, mm-hmm. uh, fifteen years of age, chatting to a load of street drinkers, uh, and she was having a look over and going, "Yeah." Right, and then I, of course, naturally the conversation came to an end. I came over and went off and went into the church, and that was the end of that. But, but, I, but I was, she was right. I mean, I do remember that conversation. And eventually, uh, with time, I would go back to a place called the Passage Day Center, which is right next to the Piazza, and I would be uh, there, um, re- street drinkers, resettlement worker. I was, I was literally scooping men and women off the street and taking them off to, to get into housing. So, like. There was no career pathway for that, but mm. but that's what would happen, you know. They, they, I think that's important. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know at the time that somehow I would start working in this area uh, as much as I have, and I've been doing this for twenty five years now, um, and I haven't lost sight of the importance of that, as I've described to you, the low threshold harm reduction work. What I mean by that is running services that accept people for who they are. Um, and their behaviours and and running services that will manage that and deal with that. Um, and then that's the low threshold side of it. And then the harm reduction side is, you know, accepting, you know, neither promoting nor denouncing drug use or alcohol use, um, but looking to uh, respond to it and uh, respond to the problems associated with risks that people take. And that's that's it in a nutshell when I, when I come down to it. Like that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. Deli- like firstly, delivering services, then sort of managing them and then eventually des- leading, designing them, you know, re- employing people through places like the Analyphy and, and, and delivering services. But, but I've, I've kind of, sorry if I've jumped ahead, but, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's the passion. It's what I do, you know? Uh, yeah. Education wise, what, yeah. what did you do? Like it was 20, you were 21, I think you said when you first yeah. went and volunteered. So what came after that? So you, you moved back to Ireland when in 2000, so that's 18 years ago, you were 30. So what happened between 21 and 30? Okay. So, so I, I start, so I started, so I did, I did the volunteer work mm. and, and that went well. And I really realized that it, 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 you know, it, it captured me, you know, like I was, I was into it. Then I started working in what they would call um, cold weather shelters, winter shelters for homeless people. They were opened up temporarily from, from say, uh, beginning of November to the end of March. A lot of innovative stuff would happen around then. And there was, a, you know, the people that worked in there, again, it was a real click. You know, you'd work with a lot of good friends, <laughs> second generation Irish working in there mm. as well. And, um, and you'd, you'd run hostels where, you know, there'd be three staff on and 90 people living in there and they Chaos. were all straight. Yeah. Um, and when it got really, really cold, it went up to a hundred, these places were up to 120 beds with four staff. Right. Um, I learned a lot. I cut my teeth <laughs> on mm-hmm. in there, you know, as well. Uh, and then, you know, I knew that I was interested in working with people around drug problems and alcohol problems. So I went and worked because there was, there was kind of, there was no, there was a recession. There was no permanent jobs. So you'd jump around from contract to contract and you'd, I'd end up working in like Rugby House, which was an alcohol detox in, in, on a place called Lamb's Conduit in whole, uh, up in, up, uh, up in the, up in the city. And, um, and then I'd be working in another place called the Drink Crisis Centre, uh, another detox. Um, actually that detox, here's an inter- interesting fact. That's in an elephant and castle. There's a, on Brook Drive before. It was a detox. It was it was the maternity wing of Lambeth Hospital, and I was born in that detox <laughs> building, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it wasn't a detox at the time. Um, anyway, so so I, I would I would work with all these in these different jobs, you know. But and, and I was really frustrated because you know you know yourself, you want to get a permanent job, yeah. you want to you know you want to get a job, put your feet under the under the under the desk and all that. But looking back, it was a it was a real a great learning 
ground for me to, to, to go and do all those different roles. I worked in everything. I was an outreach worker in Brixton. You know, I, w- I worked alongside a, a friend of mine uh, who I haven't seen for many years called uh, called Easton. Uh, Easton was black, um, and uh, and he didn't. He, he thought I was going to get him killed because I looked like a policeman, right? <laughs> so I'd go out and do this outreach work with him, um, and uh, and he was like, he wasn't happy. But we we got we got. I started to explain to him about my background, about my Irish background, mm. and all that sort of thing, and we would talk about that, and and he we, we came to work very closely together. But the point being is. You were cutting your teeth in all these sort of different jobs and different experiences. And now, you know, what would happen was in the future when I was sort of working in the field, I'd, I'd, I'd understand the different disciplines and stuff. So it was good. You know, it was good like that. So that was sort of that. And I traveled a lot in the 90s. So I went off to, I lived in Melbourne for a year, uh, around 96, 97, um, and did different things. You know, I worked in an office and stuff. Um, and then I came back and I and then and did a job in uh, in the Passage Day Centre, about three and a half years, and then we're travelling again and, and, and travelled around the world um, for six months. And then when I came back, it was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to do this here. I don't want to because you got the travel bug, right? What are you mm-hmm. going to do? You know, you, you can't, you can't always keep travelling. You, know, yeah. you have to have a lot of money to do that, right? So you have to work. So Ireland was doing really well. It was, it was, it was booming. You know, the recession. Uh, sorry, the 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 it was, it was booming. Celtic Tiger yeah. was just kind of yeah coming yeah. to the fore a bit. Yeah. And, um, and so there, there was work. So I came over, uh, and Sarah came over and we, we eventually, uh, realized that obviously uh, most of the jobs at the time were in, were in Dublin and we, we moved towards here and we kind of, yeah, we just settled down in, into, it could have been for a month, could have been for six months, could have been for, you know, what it turns out to be 18 years. I find so it fascinating long. that your entire family has moved back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Now it doesn't always happen like that for, for a London Irish, but, but, uh, yeah. And, and it is it's it's not easy you know like i mean if you're in london and there's it's like london's a power, economic powerhouse you know there's work and all that and that's why Irish people move there mm. right but we move over here right so so you have to you have to find work and all that sort of thing and i know many people who would have moved back over in you know to ireland whether they were london irish or, or irish who had been away and come back and when the recession hit in 2007 2008 uh had to leave again mm-hmm. right and the challenge was to stay you know, yeah. the challenge was to stay and work and bring our children up in Ireland, uh, you know, three daughters who were Dubliners, you know, and, um, and, and wanting to stay. And, you know, that was the challenge. It wasn't the challenge wasn't, you know, oh, how big a car have I got or anything like that or what's the next move? It was let's stay, let's, let's keep working, you know, and that's what it was like for many, many years from 2007 on. Interesting question just to me personally, the three daughters, what's the accent like? Oh, yeah, I'll bring you up there later. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, they have, they have, um, they start out at home with kind of English accents. Uh-huh. Then they go to school, and they get, uh, they get, they get Dublin accents. Um, how Dublin an accent? There's different. There's different. Accents. It depends on who they're in. Because if they're at yeah, home and they're talking not, to you, they're not D four. Okay. <laughs> Because I, I, I'm terrible for that. I, I will talk to somebody and I will pick up their accent and I'll have inflections and I, it's really, really strange. But I would imagine that. I'm just really interested because obviously with you having like quite a strong English yeah. accent, like your daughter's growing up in Dublin, do they have a kind of a, a mixed thing where it's kind of on the fence a little bit? A little bit Some of their words, their friends will say to them, ooh, <laughs> listen to you. Yeah. Um, I, I, interestingly, my, look, I've been here for 18 years and I sound like I've just walked Stepped out of South boat. East London yeah um but uh I, I went to Mel like I went to Melbourne for a year and came back as like, ah yeah mate because <laughs> it, it, it the inflection go up yeah. and it's not that much different um and or to, to the point where I was in I went to work in the Passage Day Centre and I was sitting down with my friend Kathy Strong and she was like um uh, so where are you from and I said I'm from Greenwich <laughs> and she said uh, oh we have a Greenwich and I said yeah that's where I'm from and she was like how long are we in Australia for <laughs> I was like 11 months <laughs> like I sounded like a true blue yeah. you know so yeah because it's not that different but I've been here for 18 years and it hasn't any that's impact stuck. how long um, have you been involved with the Analyphy Drug Project oh okay yeah so uh, look I'm really proud to be the chief executive of the Analyphy right it's it's a fantastic organisation the uh, it, 5th of November 2005 so it's just over 13 years uh, and again like I didn't like it, it it's it that time has passed really quickly you know um and 
yeah, uh, it's it's been a really it, when I joined in two thousand and five. As I say, it was it was it was still Celtic Tiger, just barely. Um, and then you know, very very soon after, within a couple of years, we went to recessionary time. So we had to you know get through, keep the charity going, and get through uh, very very difficult times. You know, but the Analyphy itself has been in existence since nineteen eighty two, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, as I say, it's a really innovative. Uh, team that we have here and really really dedicated people like so there's 30 34 of us uh staff members and then there's around a similar number of volunteers so between the board and the frontline services and the back office volunteers you know there's about 70 of us okay yeah yeah it's good and what are the actual aims you're working towards? Because I know you kind of sometimes haven't been to some of your town hall meetings around mm. the country that you feel almost as if you're being labelled as if it's, oh, drugs free for all, decriminalisation, mm. as if everybody's going to be going to the corner shop and buying 20 spots yeah. and bags of weed and pills over the counter. It's not like that at all. I know that kind of anyone with a bit of sense should know that, but not everybody does. Do you, no. does, do you find that There's tired no, sometimes? No one, nobody in their right mind wants you know, young people taking drugs and more people taking drugs. I don't want that to happen. Right? You have a great quote I saw online about uh, seatbelts in cars. Oh, that, that's not mine. That, that's, that's somebody else. But there's a, yeah, it's something about, you know, um, oh God, I can't remember it. <laughs> I'm not against people driving cars, but I am in favour of people using seatbelts. That's, I that's think the one. It Sorry, it wasn't my quote. But it, but it's a good point. It's my quote now, okay? It's your quote now. <laughs> but I mean, look, harm reduction. The, the one that I like is, is, you know, if you can't be good, be careful. We've all said that, right? And what we're saying, when, when, when people go out the door, right, and they, they walk down the door and your loved ones walk out the door, you want them to come back, right? You want them to come back safe and well, like alive and well, right? So are they going to take risks? We all take risks, right? That's what life is, you're taking mm-hmm. risks, right? So if you're going to take risks around drugs, um, it's safer not to use them, right? But if you are going to use them, you need to, you need to you need to manage those risks, right? Mm-hmm. So that that's the point. You know, harm reduction messaging, like you know, you know, taking taking a test a dose, you know, um, uh, being with using with other people, all that sort of stuff. Um, that's just good sound advice that keeps people alive. Um, but um, sorry, your question. Your question was. Your aims. What aims. is it that you're actually finding? So, yeah. so safer injecting facilities and decriminalization of the user are my. Un- is my understanding yeah, of your no, no, Okay, so they're the, they're the big policy issues we're pushing for. So obviously we do other things, we have services and we provide them. But in terms of policy positions, you know, the big ones that people know us for uh, and I would have talked about a lot was, was, is uh, supervised injection facilities. So firstly, supervised injection facilities. People inject drugs, particularly in Dublin, and, but elsewhere as well, um, uh, to, to a great extent. We've got an we injecting culture, right? We have about 400 people at any one time uh, sorry, any given month injecting in Dublin City Centre multiple times, right? So um, what we need to do is provide them a safe space. And then people think, well, you just want to facilitate their drug use. Uh, no, but I do recognise that this behaviour is happening and the evidence is very clear that if you provide somewhere safe to go to inject drugs, then what happens is you remove the barrier of stigma. They come in. I worked in the one in Sydney. It, it's a fantastic service. They walk, people walk in. And they're able to use their drugs there. And it's just normal, uh, you know, in terms of like interactions and stuff. And if anything happens, like I, there was three people that we saved in the two weeks I was there, proper full on uh, overdoses turning blue and we saved their lives. Others, you know, they were having sort of slow overdoses and we put them onto oxygen, but there was many, many of them and they could have died as well if they were outside. So, um, so you know, we know that you save lives and we know that you get people through the treatment and rehabilitation faster. And that's what everybody wants to hear. How? What about people not taking drugs? Well, you know, people need to want to stop, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you leave them down an alleyway with no engagement, with no relationship, you're less likely to be able to encourage them to do things safer. And then when they're ready to, to come forward, and get help and have those relationships. So if you don't have engagement with people, you've got nothing, right? So I think uh, I think that's why the injecting rooms, uh, for m- many many reasons, but but they're really important, right? Now the problem is we still haven't got one open in Ireland, uh, or particularly in Dublin. There, there's there's work being done by Merchants Key, and there's planning permission to be got, and all that sort of thing. And it is disappointing, it is frustrating because. We started lobbying for that in Jan- January twentieth, two thousand and twelve. That's a long time ago, mm. and um, and we're patient. But, you know, 
if I could have opened it up on 21st of January 2012, I would have done. Like, because if you're a harm reductionist, it's all about getting on with it. Implementation is everything. Now, I recognise that you've got to bring people along, and if you want to see change, you've got to you've got to you know explain what you're trying to achieve. You've got to see laws being changed and all that. And we, we we've achieved a lot, but you know, recently, right in Melbourne, in a place called Richmond in Melbourne, they opened one up within eight months. Okay, from political decision to law changes, to um, public procurement, to change into building, to, to opening the door. I mean, like, why are we taking so long? So, you know, Why do you feel that holdup is? What well, is the actual roadblock? Well, the official, the official answer is, is process. You know, you have to have process. Look, I just hope that we can get it open sooner rather than later because people are like people's lives will be saved. You know what I mean? What about the stigma of such facilities? Because I recently read a thread on Reddit in the Ireland subreddit and people talked about how much of a kip O'Connell Street had become for want of a better yeah. description. You know, just um drug users hanging about, just a weird vibe kind of you know, it's mostly like casinos, arcades, takeaways, which is yeah. a terrible thing to kind of see on something. So that's- there's a number of issues there, right? Yeah. It's like there's there's about the types of businesses that are there, um, and improvements in that regard. Um it's a it's an amazing street, you know, it's uh-huh. just sitting, it's just at the end of our road. It's akin to our Champs Elysees, you know, but like, like, like on, on a totally different end of the scale. You know, and it, and it, and it's not it hasn't had investment. It has, you know, the spires there and the GPO is there and mm. you know that that's in great history on, on the doorstep it, of the oh place. Oh my god, right? Um a lot of people, sorry, just in the thread, Tony, said that they thought it was because of drug services that were located in the area. And a lot of this was because people in the suburbs and worst affected areas didn't want them in their vicinity. Drug, drug services opened up because of a drug problem. So they didn't, we didn't create the drug problem. Like people will always be drawn to city centres. To the Like if you go to London now, it's, 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 it's so sad as well. You know, same like when we go out tonight, out of here tonight, and we leave Abbey Street, if we go around, we'll find tents and sleeping bags and I can show you where needles are and all that sort of stuff. Um, it, and, and capital cities do have that. Um, now, why is, it, why, why is it so bad here? I think we do need, I think we need homes for homeless people. I think we need uh, drug treatment services more of for people who use drugs. But we do need to recognise that people will still use those drugs. So it's not that we need one pilot service. We need a network of supervised injection facilities in the city centre. And people don't want to hear that. But that's where people live. Right? And that's get where people get drawn to. They go out and they tap or, you know, begging. This is where people come to to earn their money. Do you know what I mean? So um, it is not that drug services opened up and people came here. People were here, right? And that drug services opened up. And also, you know, trying to open up drug services is very, very difficult, right? Um, certainly now. And nobody, like NIMBYism is rife everywhere. Nobody wants it on their doorstep. Mm-hmm. So the city centre... This center, is what I was about to ask us. Where would you propose that these... I think they, I, I think they belong in the city centre. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I think it's like, not, not, like, not you know, no, I get the idea that there might be, you know, arguably over-concentration, but you still will need drug services and ha- some homeless services in city centre. That's in every capital C, as far as I'm aware, you know? Mm-hmm. Now... Um, you know, I think I think that there's balance to be had, and I think that there's a responsibility on drug service providers to be responsible neighbours. I think there's a responsibility on people who use drug services to be accountable and responsible themselves. And you need to talk to them. They are people. You need to explain to them what kind of behaviours are. You know, if you Acceptable. want to keep your services open and up and running, that's what's got to happen. I think that. Um, it is complex, right? And it's but it's not without its solutions. We need a plan for the city. I think we need a plan, particularly for Dublin. We need a plan for the city centre, and we need uh, and and that plan will need to be implemented because that's what, that's my point right now. Is everything needs like there's a lot of talk. We need more. We need to implement. We need to move towards decriminalisation of drugs, right? So why would I be talking about decriminal decriminalisation of drugs, right? Prohibition has failed, right? It is quite clear that prohibition has failed. We have more drugs, they are purer, they are cheap. Readily available. Readily available. They're across the country. This is where heroin began, north in the city of Dublin. We're sat in north in the city of Dublin right now. This, but now you can get any drug you want in, the, in Dublin and you can get them in most towns and villages across Ireland, right? So, so you can't say we've won, right? Mm-hmm. We, we, prohibition has failed, right? Of course. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we legalise all drugs tomorrow? 
I don't think so. It's probably it's it, it's a too much of a big big issue to try. Like it's a it's a quantum leap, right? And a big debate, and we'd have to we'd have to spend a lot of time. I but, think a lot of people don't understand the difference between yeah, decriminalization okay, so that's what and to, legalization. Right. So so prohibition, no, nothing. You can't be in possession of drugs. You can't deal in drugs, of course. Yada yada yada. Uh, legalization is where you you regulate the supply and control of drugs, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so alcohol is legal and it's regulated, right, um, and controlled. Uh, so that's an example there. Decriminalization is in the middle. It's the middle ground, right? It's where drugs remain illegal, right? It's where dealing is absolutely illegal, right? But the intervention when you ca- when you come across someone who is in possession of drugs for personal use, and you have to decide what that means in terms of thresholds, how many in Portugal is 10 days worth of drugs, right? Um, but if when Ireland does decriminalise drugs, I hope they do, I have my doubts, but I hope they do, um, we'll decide, what, and I hope it's realistic as well, we'll decide what that threshold is. But um, the point being is, when you come across people who have drugs for personal use on them, you, you don't send them to court, you, you have a structure that sends them off for a health intervention. So it might be a harm reduction intervention. So so not all drug use is problematic drug use. Uh, there's non-problematic drug use and problematic drug use, recreational or addiction. Do you get me? Mm-hmm. Right? So, but it's all health, but the response should always be health. It's all about risk. So if you're just the kind of person who takes a cup of XC or MDMA at the weekend, right, then the risk is a health risk. It shouldn't be a criminal justice response. That's our point, and um, and the and the outcomes. I, like this has happened across different jurisdictions, but the one that people point to, uh, the one people know best, is the Portuguese experience. It was reversed. It was it was referred to initially as a Portuguese experiment, and now it's the Portuguese model uh, of decriminalisation. What they have is um, is a is if you get caught, uh, let's say you come to the attention of the police because you were fighting in Temple Bar. Mm-hmm. And you have to have, and you happen to have cocaine on you, and it was personal use. The fight will be dealt with through the courts. Okay, it's not a get out of jail card. If you were beating somebody up or stealing from them, that gets dealt with in the court. But the the, the personal possession of drugs is recognised as a health issue. And in Portugal, you go to a dissuasion committee, and you you get assessed, and they say, right, this under this assessment. You you have a you're, you're a non problematic drug user, so you need to understand the risks you're taking, and you need to understand that it's not acceptable to society. You know, but it's not a criminal record. You're not going to find yourself uh, not getting a job when you're thirty because of your criminal record, or not being allowed to go to uh, America or whatever it might be. Your tra- you know your life opportunities are not affected, right? But you are you are spoken to. You are you know it's not a, it's not light. It's not a joke. It's like but you are offered. Harm reduction information. You might get a fine, right? On, on that on that example, uh, and 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 then that's it, right? That's it. And you, if you come to the attention again, then they assess you again, and maybe it's getting more problematic. But if you if you're assessed and it's a problematic uh, drug use, you you get offered treatment and rehabilitation. You get help. You get offered help. You're not made to take it, but you get offered it very early on, right? Because the police will often be the first people that, that when someone realises they got a problem or the first person they've come across. But we don't want them to be criminalised for it. It's had, no, it's had nothing positive come out of it, right? So, um, so that's the difference, I hope, explained um, in what we want to do. And um, people who are against it kind of make out that we're trying to normalise drugs. I think drugs have been glamorised and normalised enough under prohibition, okay? Uh, if you're a young person... Um, and not all young people take drugs, it obviously it has to be said, but if you are, there's, an, there's, there's a risk taking and excitement to taking drugs as well. There's a kind of, you know, the, the taboo, the prohibition. Mm-hmm. Right. So that to me, like, you know, if you, if you end up sitting up in a dissuasion committee, it's kind of boring, right? And, and, and you don't want to be there. You want to be doing something else, but you have to go and you have to be assessed and you have to be spoken to, right? It's not glamorous, you know, so let's make drugs Boring, right? Like to cigarettes people. kind of have become in yeah. recent years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And drugs stay illegal. That's what people want to hear. It's a law enforcement and public health approach to drug use, right? So you, you just, it just isn't doing anybody any good being stopped and searched and being done for possession, sent up to the courts, you know, 
and it, it, it's it's just not helpful. Um, so, and we've seen that. We've uh, I mean I I've often I I had um a, a mother and her daughter sent up to make uh, a, a donation under the under, through through the um through the court uh, through the poor box to the Analifi five hundred euros um, for her smoking a joint up at Electric Picnic. That's mad. Now, the other thing about that, again, the Probation Act is, is that it, it, you know, the, the people will tell you that it doesn't appear on your record. I, I, well, I, well, everybody who comes and works here, volunteers or otherwise, has to have guard clearance, okay? Probation Act appears on your record. It's as simple as that, right? Okay. Um, and it shouldn't, and it does. And when you read it, like, you know, obviously, and Liffey understands that people might have had a yeah. past and rehabilitated and all that. And we, we look at it for its own merited, but other employers won't, won't do that. You know, they'll look at it and go, what was that about? Mm. Oh, hang on a second. No, not having that. So, you know, it does impact on people's lives, you know? You mentioned Electric Picnic there. The Anna Liffey Drug Project and yourself did something rather interesting at last year's festival. Yeah, we, we, um, we worked in the welfare tent at Electric Picnic for the for the second year, actually. We went there in 2017 uh, with nine volunteers in 2017 and, and were able to deliver, uh, uh, I suppose, a skeleton service because it was the first time. And then 2018, we went along with 55 volunteers and it went really, really well. We worked really closely with Code Blue, the medics who were in the tent next to us. Um, and I suppose I should explain what, what it means to go and deliver harm reduction services at a festival, right? So we don't have drug checking for a start. Okay. That is often in the news and that's something that happens in the UK and other and in other um uh European uh countries, but we don't have that in Ireland. It is being looked at. Whether it happens, when it happens, I don't know. Um but what we do is we go down and we work in the welfare tent and we will provide harm reduction information um tailored to festivals to individuals who come to us and talk to us about their drug use and maybe what they're planning to do. And we talk to them about the risks they might be taking and how to keep themselves safe. That's one thing that we do. We, we do that at the welfare tent and we do that on outreach, walking through the campsite. Um, and I have to say, we're really grateful to Festival Republic for letting us do that because we're there at their um, gift, you know. And um, And then the other thing that we do is, you know, maybe – later on in the early evening or maybe through the night, obviously people turn up having taken drugs and they would have gone, most people uh, will have gone into the um, the medics, right, into Code Blue who are doing their work next door to us. And then they, they have to come and see our staff, and Liffey's staff, um, as part of the protocol. Once they're happy that the, the, the medical issue is dealt with, um, then they have to come and see us and we talk to them and make sure that the people get paranoid depending on what drugs they've taken, anxious, tearful, all that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. upset. So um so they, they they come in and they sit with us or they have a lie down in the in the welfare tent and we talk to them. We just look after them, psychosocial supports, um, doing things for them, maybe ringing their parents to come and get them or their pals or whatever it might be. Looking after them, just good stuff. Um doing doing what others what, what, what people sometimes do for each other in their own group, you know, their own mm-hmm. set. So that's what we do. Um and uh and yeah, and it and it worked really well. We saw four hundred and three in two thousand eighteen, we saw four hundred and three people at the welfare tent. Uh, we saw mul- we, we we engaged with multiple groups of say five to ten people uh, throughout the uh, throughout the campsites. Um, we were giving out condoms. We were giving out harm reduction information. Just engaged with people in a mature adult discussion. So it's not a case of going along and saying just say no. It's a case of going along and saying, listen, it is always safer not to take drugs, right? But if you're going to, this is what you need to know. And we got real engagement. We got we got really good engagement with people. And some people came along and they didn't want it. They, when they asked us about the risks they were taking, I know they went away and thought, I'm not taking them. <laughs> and, that, you know, and that keeps them safer. But yeah. not, not everyone, but, but other people were taking away the advice that, you know, use together, you know, take a test a dose, all that sort of stuff. Good, solid harm reduction information that keeps people alive and well, you know. So that's good. Given how much fuss was made over – Cannabis from medicinal use, mm. you know, like you had mothers doing charity walks yeah, from like yeah, court yeah. to Dublin difficult. or whatever thing like. Like that must be to see the government stance on that must be quite demoralising to you for somebody who wants general decriminalisation when they can't even give it to kids for medicinal use. Uh, yeah, now you know they're, they're, they're different issues, okay, and and I think that 
and and the the thing about drug policy is that lots of things get conflated. You know, like uh, you start talking about decrim and think people think you're talking about legalization, and then if you're not, and then if you and if you're not talking about legalization, then someone will talk to you about you know legalizing cannabis. Um, look, America is probably the place to be looking towards. That's where everyone looks has has taken their example in terms of a, a, this, this this war on drugs for what a better description, and yet America. Uh, depending on the state, has legalized, decriminalized um, uh, uh, cannabis to varying degrees, you know, um, and that's where. And 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 I was in Toronto recently uh, when they had literally just legalized cannabis um, uh, right across. They were selling it in in, in shops, and they, and after two days, they ran out of supply. <laughs> um, but but people are looking to that, right? They're looking to they're looking to America. They're looking to Canada to see what happens there. Um, Will Ireland uh, legalize cannabis? Um, not right now, right? But um, all depending on how things pan out in America and Canada and anywhere else. I think it almost has to happen in the UK first before it'll happen. Well, here. well, drug policy is nowhere on the agenda in the UK. I mean, at least in Ireland, we have engagement with the state. At least in Ireland, we have a national drug strategy that is engaging. Um, in, in the UK, and my colleagues are totally frustrated everything is about brexit you know i think there's no agenda to 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 legalize cannabis in ireland at the moment um and that there, there may be in the future there may be but right now there's not you know you said that you lobbied was it for the first time in 2012 or you proposed yeah this kind of harm reduction and um, the safe yeah the safe yeah. ingestion facilities and then onto the crim now nearly seven years later how much closer to it do you think you actually are? You know, it is frustrating. As I said to you, you know, if you're a harm reductionist, and I am, right, um, you want to get on with it. It's just as simple as that. Like, you want to help people. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it is, you know, things are taking longer than, than I'd hoped, you know, um, for change to, to, to sort of be implemented. Um, but we are, like, it, but the I'm also sort of uh, optimistic. We are further down the tr- we are further down the track, um, but I have to say, you know, um, I feel somewhat negative at the moment in terms of like wanting to get the supervised ingestion facilities open. Like, come on, let's get it, let's get it going, let's let's get working. I know the positive impact it will have, um, and and then once that first one is piloted and evaluated, and I'm sure it'll be positive, we'll see more. Um, our colleagues down in Cork want to open one. They, they do. They, they, they really do. They've identified a building, right? I have to, they have to, they've been told they have to wait until the pilot one in Dublin is evaluated. Like, that, that's, you know, and, and, yet we, and yet we can't even get it open. You know, so, so that's a problem. And then decrim. Um, I really believe that decriminalisation of drugs for personal use is the right thing to do. We will save lives. We will save taxpayers' money. Um, and we and and people who use drugs uh, for their own personal use um, won't have their life opportunities impacted in the way that people who have gone before uh, had, um, and they'll have the opportunity for change and all that sort of thing much more than than, than uh, people had before. So, but uh, I am concerned that uh, that that might that that won't happen. We have a working group that's looking at the uh, at the issue of of um decriminalization of drugs for personal use and uh they were they were due to report back by the end of 2018 and 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 they they hadn't by then so you know i think uh i'd be worried that 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 we won't see decriminalization recommended and and if that's the case then then we've got we've still got we're still going to push for it we're still going to fight for it um and but it just makes it harder but um we will see. Time will tell. 